you need to have a determination. You also need tools. You need strategies. You need positive reinforcement. You need good messages all the time. But in addition to those things, you've got to have tenacity. You've got to have grit. I have never known anyone to be able to succeed in transforming anything negative in their life to something positive without willpower. This is Rebound Stronger with Fauzi. Life is full of ups and downs. It's easy when we are doing great. However, how we deal with the lows determines whether we are going to stay down for a long time or recover fast and become better. There is a saying, the hardest deal goes into the hottest furnace. I do believe that we can always overcome adversities. These struggles can come from challenging childhood, financial issues, relations or marital problems, disabilities, and many other forms. I decided that I need to start reaching out to people who have overcome these adversities and learn from them how they use these difficulties as a stepping stone, how these setbacks have changed their life for the better. I record my conversation with them so that you can also learn from this amazing individual. Take note and take massive actions to make our life better. This is Rebound Stronger Podcast with Fauzi. Hi, Rebound Stronger listeners. I'm super excited today, sun- Saturday morning here in Singapore, Friday afternoon in the United States where my friends now, uh, Manny, uh, is here with us. Before we get into the interview with Emmanuel Wolf, I would like to read one quote which I found from a book which I started reading yesterday, Daring Greatly by Brené Brown. So when I open up the book, it starts with this quote taken from Theodore Roosevelt's speech called The Citizens in Republics. This speech was made in Paris more than 100 years ago, 1910. So here's the quote. It is not the critics who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doers of the deeds could have done them better. The credits belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust, sweat, and blood, who strive violently, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcomings, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spend himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end triumphs of great high achievement, who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. All right, so that's the quote. Let's jump in. I would like to introduce my friend from Stockton, California, Emmanuel Wolfie. His friend called him Manny. He will share with us about his personal experience, his personal struggles, going through some of the toughest low point in life. But he got through and even come back stronger. So from being raised in a cult, living in one of the most violent city in the uh, United States, being homeless, addicted to drugs and drinks, and so on. Now he has transformed his, not just his life, but also others as a speaker, coach, and author. We'll talk also about his book. Many helps others using motivational psychology, neuroscience, and good old-fashioned hard work to overcome the barriers between ourselves and our optimal self. He's a living example that we can change our life no matter where where we are in life now. So, and never too late. Hi, Manny. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me on the show. So excited to have you on the show. (laughs) Thank you for for being here. Yeah, it's my pleasure. The people listening won't know this, but you and I tried to make this work a long time ago and we weren't able to. So it's nice to be here now. Yeah, that's my fault. (laughs) 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 Yeah. Manny, are you ready to inspire? I am always ready to inspire. All right. Let's start with something positive. What are the three things you are grateful for at this moment? Oh, wow. There are so many. Um, I am grateful for tenacity, perseverance, and a vision of how things could be. You've gone through many difficult experience, struggles in, in, in your life for so many years, from your childhood till your maybe late 20s, if I'm not wrong. 
Well, I mean, in my late 20s is when I had the first of what would prove to be a series of pivotal experiences. But mm. the first one happened 28 years old when I was uh, quite literally planning the, the murder of another man. And um, I just, as I was sitting there making the plans with one man to hunt down another man, I just realized I couldn't do this. And so I figured out a way out of that situation and literally just disappeared from my whole life within a matter of probably two hours of that conversation. I was gone. I had everything that I owned in two small boxes and two girls who I had never met before were giving me a ride from the town I lived in back to the town where my mother lived, where I would ultimately wind up first hiding out and then second starting to heal myself. Okay, let's let's go back a little bit. How you get there? Maybe you can share your stories. How you end up planning murdering a guy? Well, the specifics of that situation, I can't tell that story unconnected from the story of my whole life. Yeah. And so it kind of goes like this. I was born into a cult and I was brainwashed against ever being able to sort of fit in to the society I live in. Within the walls of the cult, we didn't want to fit in. We wanted to be different. We wanted to not be part of it. And when I was 14 years old, all of that came crashing down because my my family, my actual family, moved away a little bit. Uh, we were still sort of connected to that organization, but for the first time in my life, we had our own house and we didn't live in one big house with everyone else. How how big is the cult back then? Back then, you know, maybe, I'm not sure, maybe 50 or 60 people. Uh, I'm not positive about that, but so that was the size of it. And, you know, we were all marching to the beat of the same drum, so to speak, meaning we all believed in, practiced and agreed upon the same ideas that did not fit into the rest of the world. And so when I was eight years old, we moved to the ghetto that you mentioned where I had to fight every day. Mm -hmm. And I had to fight every day and I learned how to read people very quickly. When I was 12 years old, my family moved away from the, the ghetto neighborhood, but in the same town. And so we had our first somewhat taste of being, you know, If only by about 10 miles, we were somewhat separated from the main the main group. So we spent two years in that situation before I was suddenly just expected to figure out how to find a job and contribute money to the household when I was taught that money was evil. I was taught from birth that money was what the devil was using to destroy the world. That was something we believed in as a group. And so I struggled... I mean, I struggled as a child too, but I struggled with that so much. I mean, I've had probably a hundred jobs in my life, you know, which is something not many people can say. And I was fired from most of them because I just couldn't reconcile the the difference, the contrast between what how I was raised and how I was suddenly expected to behave. And so, um, you know, that was that was a very very difficult thing for me. And what it did, because I had so much conflict there, and the only thing that I knew as a child was being a rebel, being an outsider, you know, using drugs and stuff like that was very common how I grew up. So I went to the rebels, the outsiders, and the drug users as a kid. And along with that comes violence, comes criminal activity, comes, you know, addiction and things like that. And so basically it all just got kind of worse and worse and worse up until my 28th birthday. And by the time I stood there making those plans that would ultimately change my life, I had already crossed so many lines and so many boundaries that I thought I'd never cross that by the time that was, you know, that moment where I'm holding a gun and I'm talking about hunting someone down, I just knew that was a line I wasn't ready to cross. So that's a very, very short version of how I got there. So that kind of your wake up call, okay, you didn't want to do this. This is something, I guess, in your mind, maybe if you cross, there's no, maybe it's, it's, there's no going back. It was just getting worse and worse and worse. Right. Yeah, exactly. I didn't see any possibility of redemption. And, you know, there was a fair chance I wouldn't have lived through it anyway. You know, the person that we were 
making plans to find was not a nice guy. You know, <laughs> he was he was plenty dangerous in his own right. So um, who knows how it would have turned out if I had not had the the idea to just vanish. So okay, you said uh, you, you decided that all right, I'm going to disappear or and, and maybe change your life. So what's the biggest challenge at that time when when you trying to okay maybe do something different uh, with your life, do something better with your life? Well, the biggest challenge at that time, right at that moment, or not that moment, but let's say the first two or three years after that day yeah. was learning how to survive and live without getting high on drugs all the time. So that was the first challenge I had to, I had to overcome. I had to, you know, get sober. And that was, uh, I did that in a whole different city. So that was the first one. And that one didn't prove to be very difficult, actually. I was so ready by the time it happened that I was willing to do pretty much anything you know, <laughs> in order to not have to go back. And so I went to a, into a recovery community, as we call them, Alcoholics Anonymous, and I just did everything that people said to do. I just followed it all as though my life depended on it. So I can relate to that also. Sometimes for me, is is we decided... But I, I also want to learn how you, you, you can be consistent in, in, in trying to get rid of your, let's say, bad habit. Because sure. sometimes, sometimes I, I decided, hey, I want to change. I want to get rid of this habit, I, which I don't like. But mm -hmm. my struggle is I keep on falling to the same habit. Maybe I, maybe I do it for two weeks, then I fall to the same bad habit. Or something happens, uh, my mood changed, then I... I get trapped into the same habits. Yeah. I think that there has to be a reason pushing you to change that is stronger than the hold of whatever the habit is. Now, we have different habits that hold us with different strengths, right? Mm -hmm. There are little habits that may or may not make a big difference if you change them. And then there are much deeper habits, the kind of habits that come from our habitual way of thinking. Does that make sense? Yeah. And those are those are more challenging to change. And I find that, you know, habit change is an interesting thing. And I see a lot of people promising ways to do it. And I see a lot of people promising that they can teach it. But for instance, I don't think my habit of going to bed late because I like to stay up late, late into the night and then I like to sleep until later on into the morning. I don't think that habit is sort of has the same strength to it as say, well, I have a, another habit of exercising, but I used that habit to replace the habit of drugs, right? Mm. There's nothing pushing me to change the sleeping habit. Does that make sense? Yep. There's, yep. there's no big, like my life won't change in any dramatic way. <laughs> Your life is fine. There's nothing really <laughs> yeah, exactly. pulling you down because of that habit. Right. And the only thing that happens in my case with that habit is I compare myself to other people, you know? And so sometimes we all, we're all guilty of that, where I'll look at some of the people I admire and they're getting up at 6 AM and I finally have just accepted that's not for me. You know, I'm self-employed. I'm a master of my own destiny, so to speak. And I can work at 10 PM if I want to, you know, and I do yeah. a, a lot of nights I work at 10 PM and it's wonderful. I love it. It's a good time for certain kinds of tasks. So that's not a habit that has a lot of um, teeth in a way. But the habit of using drugs that I was in had a lot of teeth. I had to change that. And my life had come to a point where it was very clear I had to change it. And so everybody tends to agree that you have to substitute one thing for another with habits. So yeah. I, I would think about this in, in, you know, if I was coaching you and your habits, I might say to you, well, one of the things you have to do is you have to have enough pressure pushing you that you're willing to get out of your comfort zone and change that habit. Then you have to put something else in place of the thing you're trying to get rid of. So uh, I hope that answers your question. I feel like it does. And that's kind of the truth about habits is they're not all created equal. And a lot of them that we think we have to change, we may not really even have to change. So I think like, for example, I tend to eat potato chips Ah, chocolate yes. bars <laughs> when, when <laughs> I got a little bit more pressure. <laughs> so yeah, maybe I'll, I'll change that to healthier snack. Yeah. Any recommendation? <laughs> well, you know, eating habits are especially 
deeply set in, in our psyches, in our subconsciouses. We don't just eat the way we eat for no reason. And it's important to understand that. So with something like that, I would say something like what will happen. The thing about eating food that's unhealthy for you is it's a very slow decline. Okay. And so usually by the time you've put on 10 or 20 or 50 or whatever, you know, the amount of weight and gotten to the lack of vitality that makes you want to change, there's a lot to undo. What I would say for something like if you wanted to physically replace one habit with another, every time you felt like eating junk food, drop and do five or 10 push-ups and then eat something healthy every time. But here again, it comes back to you got to want it bad enough. And so there's something that underlies all of this change psychology. And I don't hear this talked about a lot. All of the psychology of transformation and personal change, at some point or another, it requires the tenacity. Remember you asked me at the starting of the interview, three yeah. things I was grateful for, yeah. tenacity, perseverance, and a vision that things can be better. So could you apply those things and aggressively towards changing that eating habit? Yeah. Now, the answer may be no. But if you can, and you do something to interrupt the pattern, right? And here comes the neuropsychology part. You feel like chips or chocolate. As soon as you recognize that sensation, you do 10 push-ups and eat something healthy. The next time, you do 10 push-ups and eat something healthy. The push-ups will break the pattern in your brain. Literally, neurophysically, it'll start to rewire the connectors, right? And then... So you mean it, it will kind of relate potato chips with maybe some some discomfort of push up for me, something like that, is it? Well, so maybe that, but I think it's more like a positive reinforcement. All right. Instead of wiring push-ups and or, or junk food and the misery of push-ups, the push-ups will just oh. break the pattern. All right. And plus they're healthy. Got it. Got it. Got it. Now, what will happen is your brain will start to go, Okay, I want junk food. Oh, now I know what I'm used to. Every time I want junk food, I wind up doing 10 push-ups for some stupid reason, you know? <laughs> and I wind up eating something healthy. So, so over time, it just skips everything else and goes, oh, I'm, I want a snack. How about something healthy? Now, I can tell you, I know this one firsthand because I used to eat garbage. And now I eat very, very healthy. And in my case, I was underweight because I like to do um, drugs that made me stay up all night. And I wouldn't eat. And so I gained weight and learned how to eat healthy just by consistently doing that. And I did that exact thing, by the way. Thanks for that, Manny. Just what's your biggest, the biggest lessons you, you can share with audience, maybe who's facing similar, I mean, going through similar experience with you? Yeah. What do you think was your, your biggest lesson you, 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 you learned uh, from, from your previous Uh, years. Well, the biggest lesson I learned was also found in the in my answer to your first question about the three things. But again, I don't hear a lot of talk about this in the world of of personal improvement and and change psychology. There, you need to have a determination. You also need tools. You need strategies. You need positive reinforcement. You need good messages all the time. But In addition to those things, you've got to have tenacity. You've got to have grit. I have never known anyone to be able to succeed in transforming anything negative in their life to something positive without willpower. And so when people ask me this question that you've just asked, you know, what's the one biggest lesson? It's get up one more time than you fall. But there's a lot encapsulated in that, right? And I feel like I want to explain that a little bit for your listeners and kind of dive in a little deeper. Yes, go ahead. If you think on any level that changing a habit or transforming yourself or becoming who you want to be is a thing that can happen to you from the outside, let's say you hire me, right? And I charge you an exorbitant amount of money because that's what I do with my one-on-one -on -one clients. I want to know they're serious. And yep. one of the ways I find out if they're serious is I make them pay, you know. But um, there are people who, when it comes right down to it, they won't just sort of dig in and push forward. And that's something that nobody can give you. That's something that no coach could ever instill in you. It's something you have to find in yourself. 
the best you could hope for with that particular characteristic, that particular quality, is that someone could explain it to you in a way that made sense so that you activated it. Because it's within us all, right? It's there. It's in us. It's, it's survival-level hardwired instinct. But it's covered under so many layers of stories and excuses and, and cushioning in society and stuff that many people don't know they have it. And so, again, I circle all the way back around, my friend, and I say the one biggest lesson I could share with people is you've got to have it inside of you to get up one more time than you fall. Great. So, Manny, tell us about your book. Great. What's the title? What you talk about in that book? The title of the book is The Tao of the Unbreakable Man. That's right. And what it is, is it is the story of my life as truly as I could represent it without making myself a hero or a victim, just telling the story and then giving the observations of how I got through the things I got through, what characteristics or lessons or insights came from surviving those struggles that I survived. And so it's the story of my life, but it's also meant to be an inspiration and a personal improvement guide. And that's it in a nutshell. Um, there's much more to it than that, but it's a little hard to sort of unpack it without somebody reading the book itself. So I say, go get the book. <laughs> Read it yourself. Wait, 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 uh, is, it, is it published uh, uh, in, in Amazon? Where, where people can get it and, and when? I would say get it through my website. Yeah, my website is mannywolf.com, M A N N Y. W O L F E is an E at the end. dot com, yeah. MannyWolf. dot com, and by the time this interview goes live, it will be out, released, and ready for ready for you to grab and get your hot little hands on. All right, so excited! Why do you decided to write your story into a book? Now that's a great question. The reason I decided to write it finally was because. Because of the way I was raised, and because of some of the things that I went through, I had some some really significant blocks to functioning. I was really not able to function in society. And years before I wrote the book, I I set about to learn how to undo those things. You know, I I set about to figure out how to fix myself, and I did a lot of personal work, a lot of personal improvement work. A tremendous amount, in fact, and there were still some things that just didn't lock into place for me. And then one day, I was talking to my fiance, and I was telling her a story from my childhood, and it was meant just to impress her, you know. I was just showing off, and she looked at me, and the way she looked at me, it cornered me. You know, I feel like I wind up saying this every time somebody asks me about how the book came about. I wind up telling the same story. There was just something about the way that she. Said to me that day, you have to write this stuff down. You know, I had heard that from people before, and I had always been able to dismiss it and say, joke, joke it off. You know, oh yeah, yeah, one day, totally, I will for sure. It's just something about the way she said it. You know, and I just looked at her and I said, okay, I'll do it. And I literally went home that night and started writing. And it's all down to how serious she was. It's all down to how how emotional she was in that moment, how much emotion she had when she told me that. It just took away all my excuses, you know. And so as I started writing it, I started really realizing, wow, I've never had a sort of a clear story of my whole life before this. And so what I what I now say is that the book was written so that I could have what I call an emotionally cohesive, an emotionally accurate and true story of my life. Because you know that's one of the things that will often happen with people who have been in PTSD situations or brainwashing situations or or a lot of intense situations is your life will be sort of fragmented in your memories and that's how it was for me but through the writing of the book I was actually able to string them all together all the fragments and and I can't express to you how amazing it feels to go from a life that was sort of fragmented like that to a life that feels solid and continuous. It's an amazing feeling, hands down the most healing thing I have ever done. What's your current passion at the moment? 
Well, the place where personal transformation, mastering your mindset and communication intersect, where those three things all touch, that's my passion. That's my wheelhouse, my sweet spot. That's the gift that was given to me on the other end of going through all of the challenges that I went through. And um, it, it's what I love. And where do you see yourself five years from now? <laughs> ah, geez. I mean, five years from now, I hope to have connected with, helped, and served 10,000 people or more. You know, that's all I'm dedicating my life to is I want to be prosperous and wealthy and abundant through reaching out to, connecting with, supporting, and helping as many people as I possibly can with a combination of my strengths, skills, and talents. Great. You, as an author, I'm pretty sure, and you've gone through a lot uh, trying to improve yourself, uh, develop yourself. So I'm sure you also read a lot of books. What's the three best books you recommend to the listeners to pick and read? Well, everybody should read The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and you should not just read it once. You know, it's the it's the great granddaddy of all of the business, entrepreneurship, and mindset and self-improvement books out there today. It's absolutely just, it's the, it's profound. So the seven habits of highly effective people. From there, I would say probably like, I like great science fiction literature. Stranger in a Strange Land for me is an amazing story because not only does it have nice, allegory and uh, and metaphor for for our daily lives but it's also brilliantly written that's one that i've probably read eight or nine times and then uh if i could just be a little bit of a nerd here i would say the lord of the rings trilogy why the lord of the rings i, I know it's a uh is is great fictional <laughs> i think because just because it's so good it's you know anytime i don't know i have this this tendency towards the best of the of the you know of a category in a way and that trilogy is what started that whole genre of of writing and to me it it sort of still reigns supreme as the classic it's not that you can take a whole lot of life lessons from it necessarily it's just you know every I, i go back and i read it every couple of years and it's just still fantastic you know <laughs> what can i say yeah okay how can people get in touch with you manny you know guys the best way to find me is just go to mannywolf.com and uh that's probably the best way otherwise you know you can find me on facebook Manny Wolf, or you can just send me an email if you've got questions or something that you you want to kind of start a dialogue. My email is manny at mannywolf.com. And again, don't forget there's an E on the end of wolf. So it's M-A-N-N-Y-W-O-L-F-E. And you know, there's, I've also got a, a free um, audio course. Well, yeah, it's sort of an audio course on the five pillars of charisma. So If you'd like to be a little more charismatic in your interactions with other people, whether it's your public speaking, your personal life, socially, whatever, go ahead and grab it. Go to the website and grab the uh, the free download. The five pillars of charisma. Mm-hmm. All right. So final questions. What's your definitions of courage? And maybe if you can give one parting advice to the listeners. Well, I think my definition of courage is the same as many other people's, which is Being able to do the right thing in spite of being afraid. You know, courage isn't the absence of fear. Courage is the ability to act even though you're afraid. There's nothing courageous about not being afraid, you know. <laughs> And then, you know, the parting advice, I really want to go back to what I said earlier. Get up one more time than you fall. Keep believing. Keep in, yeah, keep believing in what you believe in and keep trying to make real what you really want to do. I mean, it's just, it almost sounds like a cliche, but... I don't know if we can hear that enough, especially if we're entrepreneurs, you know. You got to believe in yourself because there will always be times when no one else does. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Manny, the author of The Down of the Unbreakable Man. You, listeners, you can go get the books at mannywolf.com. And yeah, thank you so much for sharing your story. I mean, this is really in inspiring uh I know it's just a glimpse of the your 
whole story and I'm pretty sure listeners can can get more out of your story from from the book but yeah thank you so much for your tips in terms of how we can break our bad habits also yeah I really enjoy uh, our conversations uh, this morning and it's, it's just made my day I'm so glad to hear that man it was great to finally connect with you thanks for having me on and uh, you know have a great day all right thank you all right bye bye Hey, if you like what we are creating with this podcast, make sure you join our Rebound Stronger Facebook group. This is the group where you can interact with like-minded people, people who wants to take their life to the next level, people who wants to turn their low points into breakthroughs. And as a bonus, the past podcast guests have also joined the group. So check it out and go to reboundstronger.com slash group Or you can also search the group in the Facebook. Just use the keyword Rebound Strongers. Send me a Facebook message or email me so that I can approve you into the groups. And we have big plans for you and the members. So see you inside.